So equinus, typically when you're gonna have a surgeon that's doing an equinus gradual correction, most of the time it's gonna be part of a dual correction. It's, I mean, you'll sometimes get equinus alone. Um, one of the things that I like to focus on is getting the surgeon and getting yourself to recognize why you're gradually doing an equinus deformity correction. That means most people that you woke up to, they're gonna say, what do I need a gradual correction for equinus deformity? I'll just do an open TAL and get that correction right away. So you have to realize that when you're doing these acute corrections, you're gonna be pulling on the posterior tibial nerve. Um, the angular correction on those posterior structures um, can cause nerve palsy. Um, you can have uh, excessive stretch of the skin. You're also pulling on the arteries that are passing through that posterior area. Um, so these are things to keep in mind. Um, and as we move forward, you'll see the other big challenge is measuring the equinus. Um, while everybody's used to measuring equinus one way, for the TL hex and the hex ray, you have to really train the surgeon that the equinus measurement is not your typical foot to leg measurement. And we'll get to that in a second. So you're gonna take a look at your bone model and you're gonna create an equinus uh, correction, excuse me, equinus deformity. Um, and you'll stabilize this deformity with one to two wires. And now here's your preoperative planning, which is really important. The, when you're doing gradual deformity correction using the hex system, you have to realize that the bone is one long bone. Now, when it comes to the foot, everybody's used to looking at this to that, but that's incorrect, okay? What you're looking at is this to that. So this is supposed to be one long bone straight, but you see how this, you're bisecting through the talus, the straight line over here versus the straight line of the tibia. And it's really important because people don't get confused why that apex is anterior. They don't, it doesn't make sense a lot of times because most people are used to looking at the plantar aspect of the foot to the leg, and that's not how you're measuring it. So keep that in mind when you do that. So you can open up your account, Sure to pick the right country that you're in. Username, make the patient. You don't have to do this now because we're gonna do this, we're gonna actually make the uh, bone model. So everybody's equinus is gonna be different. As opposed to the previous model that we did, those are set deformities. Everybody's equinus is gonna be a little bit different. So for example, one person may make his equinus like this and the other like this. The bone model did not come with the deformity built in. So once you make your deformity, okay, then you're gonna to have to measure it. And that's where I showed you in that last slide, that's really important. Once you can understand that measurement, then it makes the whole game a lot easier. So you're gonna pick it to left ankle, and we'll do an ankle correction. The reference fragment is proximal. Easier to measure that proximal reference fragment. We're going to get into foot measurements where we usually use a distal reference fragment. You can pick any reference fragment you want, but you have to make the measurements proper all the time. And then the deformity is going to be relative to the apex of the deformity. And we'll discuss that also. So different doctors have, different, when they're doing equinus correction, what their apex is different than some others. Some will make the apex to the subtalar joint and some to the ankle joint. So that's something that you guys will have to discuss with the physician when they're doing, before they're doing the surgery and before you're putting in the case information. So here you're gonna pick an ankle. Now, once again, this is, this is your most important x-ray. So first of all, for you guys, when you're gonna measure this as well. Bisect the tibia, bisect the talus to the Okay, which could come out as a perpendicular, but not always. You'll see some x-rays, it's uh, not always the case. Um, so you, you want to make this perpendicular going straight through here. Here's your apex. So if you kind of block out these two guys, that's an anterior apex. You see how the lines come out anterior. So, and once again, these are the two fragments that you worry about. There's this fragment and then that fragment. Okay. 
Well, so you're gonna have to measure in the AP. You're gonna create your, deform your own deformity. So try to keep it straight, but if you wanna get fancy and you wanna add in a little bit of varus, you wanna you know, translate it a drop, all these things, you're gonna have to measure once you create your own deformity. So it's going to suggest that any time you're doing an equinus correction, you're going to have to do a little bit of lengthening through the soft tissues. Um, that's to get clearance. If you just try to co correct it without doing any lengthening, the talus will jam on the tibia. So it's best to put in at least 7 to 10 millimeters of lengthening to get some clearance. And now we're going to do the same thing as the last one with the uh, um, tibial varus deformity. We're using the hex ray. So you're going to click on the hex ray button. Pick your proximal pre uh, reference fragment first. Okay. Do a pre-op. So we're going to have to calibrate. So just like on the last one, insert your marker, take a picture. So um, in real life, you're gonna have to have some sort of marker on the leg um, that you're gonna calibrate off of if you're doing preoperative planning. So here you can take a little, instead of, uh, you can just even take like a little ruler and you know, like you can just tell the, you can tell the computer, because it asks you, do you wanna use a line or a circle? You remember, I'm just gonna go back over here a second. So remember here it says that uh, you want to use a, a line versus a circle. Hold on. No, it didn't come up. It is in your thing. It asks you, use the mouse to drag the line or circle to calibrate. So you can use the line and just calibrate and know that it's 10 millimeters when you take that picture. So just confirm what you marked over there. You can do 20 millimeters, whatever you want, but you just have to make sure it's calibrated properly. Same deal. Okay, so on the AP. You're going to draw your anatomical axis through the, this, the distal portion of the tibia. And you have to make sure, this is one thing that we just have to just review over and over. Your lines have to be in the same spot. So one of the things you can do on the bone models, you can take a little marker on your bone model prior to taking your picture. I would take like a little pen. Doctor, if you have any uh, suggestions you want to add to that. But you can just take a little pen and just Kind of like mark off a spot and mark it on the side as well so you know that when you're pulling up your line over here you know you're in the exact same spot when you're running the hex portion uh, we didn't do that on the last slide but that's something that you can add to this one so that you can get a more accurate reading in a real x-ray it's going to be different because you can't mark it on the bone but you can take a paper clip if you want and but it has to be stuck to the patient when you do these Use. You can't stick it to the x-ray um, box because when the patient moves, then the leg moves and then you don't get the right calibration. So if you're going to do some sort of marker, it's got to be stuck to the patient's leg or body part that you're trying to calibrate. Make sure that the lines, so once again, you have to make sure the lines are in the same spot. So here's your AP. Um, this is a little bit different because now we're dealing with the foot. So it's the computer is looking at the tibia versus the foot as one long unit, and it's trying to make sure that the unit is aligned. So here, you're gonna make sure, just make sure that the foot kind of lines up with the leg, that you don't have any translation or varus valgus so that you can just get this uh, simple portion done. And then on the lateral side as well, you're gonna have these two separate portions. So this is, this is where it's much easier for the surgeon when they're doing it because they're forced into making this line right over here. Um, and then they, they recognize that a, apex anterior um, much easier. So we're going to put in these uh, views. Um, so this is alternative to what you said. Instead of marking on the soft bone, you can see the line of the ankle joint on both x-rays. So you use the line too and you draw the same length line of both AP and medial lateral from the ankle joint. And the top of this line 
It's exactly the same point on two x-rays. So just alternative. Everybody get enough, that? I wasn't clever enough to, to think of drawing a line like you, so I... It just <laughs> came used, to me. <laughs> I used the line tool, yeah. yeah the line tool is great, so, so I, I, you, there's a lot of tricks to do this, but ultimately remember that the hex system is trying to calibrate your picture and make the lateral and the AP align with each other and needs the same points on both the lateral and the AP. So, you know, in, in real life, you're going to have to figure out, for in real life, on, if you just have an x-ray without any marker, how do you know if you're here on the lateral and here on the AP that it's exactly the same spot? So you do need some sort of reference. So if it's pre-op, especially, it's more challenging. Post-op, you can, you can use wires that are on the frame that can enable you to use that. Um, but here we use the line tool and to know that we were in the same spot, so we have the angle joint, um, and then that uh, going up so we knew exactly where we were. Oh, okay. Now we know we're at the same level. This one's gonna go a lot faster because now you got a little bit of the hang of it from last time. It's just that the deformity's a little bit different, so um, just remember last time we had a fixed deformity, this one you're setting the deformity. Okay, so we got our reference points. So we're gonna make a zero degree valgus. You're gonna measure how much equinus you have. Um, so in this particular uh, picture, it was 31 degrees. Now you can double check on your measurement by taking a goniometer and seeing how much equinus there was and see how close you were to the program, what the program told you that you have. And then you'll know if you're off or not and how far off you are. We have our reference points. We're gonna lock them down. Let's try to make sure there's no rotation in there. So measuring rotation, you have to look down the leg and you take the second metatarsal as your rotation point. Here's internal rotation, external rotation. So you wanna measure that from the deformity to see of translating it, that means you may have locked it down in a lot of external rotation, so you're just gonna have to tell the computer, because that the computer can't tell, um, can't, uh, the hex system cannot figure out rotation. That's something that you have to figure out. So there's many ways to measure rotation in real life. Um, there's the thigh tibia axis, um, there's, the, what the, there's the second method that you can have the patient line in their stomach and you um, measure the uh, thigh versus the uh, tibia on the second metatarsal. You have the patient sitting with their foot hanging down and you see how much rotation, external or internal. Um, but those things, the computer won't guess for you. You'll have to put that in yourself. So look at your bone model and you'll see. And we move on. So osteotomy level. So this is not gonna be an osteotomy because we're just doing a soft tissue correction. Now, there can be many reasons to do an osteotomy. Um, so let's say, for example, you have a distal tibia procrovatum or a recrovatum, and the surgeon wants to do an osteotomy to correct it. You're not going to use this line then, because they, they're going to use the deformity to where the apex of the deformity is. So this is going to be more the apex of the osteotomy. So some people do their apex through the ankle joint. Some people do it through the subtalar joint. This is chosen as the ankle joint as the osteotomy level. So now we're gonna have our, move our pieces around like we did last time. So we see here how, remember how this was all the way out in, with the deformity, so now it's straightened out. Because remember, the fragments that the, we're dealing with on an equinus correction is the tibia and this portion of the foot. So this is what we want to correct and straighten out. So that's how it should look in the end. Now, it's not gonna deform the bone because it's all being done through the joint, so the joint will straighten out. Um, also, remember that end of correction parameters, meaning that you don't wanna say it's short, okay, because it's not short. You wanna say at the end of the correction, you wanna obtain how much lengthening. And that's for the surgeon to kind of figure out. Do they want seven millimeters, 10 millimeters, um, you definitely have to put in some lengthening in order to get clearance on these Aquinas uh, cases. Okay? Um, so 
So there, they make, it'll give a suggestion, you can change that. Um, you'll figure out uh, on how much you want to change, and then you lock that down. The mounting parameters, this is no different than the typical Equinus, just a pure Equinus mounting parameter. So you're gonna have your proximal ring is gonna be um, your reference ring. You wanna put that on as straight as possible, so make sure there's no tilt in there, and um, that's obviously how the surgeon, however they're trained, how they wanna put it in, pins or wires. And then here's your distal ring, okay? For the lab purposes, you don't have to waste time building the, foot, the, the ring on the foot. I'm just trying to kind of get it on. Um, do not remove the wires for the deformity portion until after you put on the whole frame. Okay, now one of the things that I noticed that uh, when you're doing a, if you're doing a preoperative plan, which we're gonna to continue to do a preoperative planning, the computer's gonna give you that recommendation of where it wants the rings to be. So, and you can move it further apart or closer together. You have to make sure that let's say you chose this as where your rings are gonna be, that's where you gotta put your rings. So if this is telling us, well, if this is telling us that it's you know 40 millimeters from the joint, you have to put your rings on that. Now you can change it in the end. If let's say the surgeon, there is, you can adjust that, but to make this match up, you have to put it on where it is. So just make sure that that's in the, in the spot where you want it. So th that, this picture doesn't represent the picture from before. So what you could do is when you're doing your preoperative planning, you can tell the computer, drag the proximal ring 110 millimeters from the ankle. So you'll drag it 110 millimeters from the ankle, and then the computer will come up with this, um, will look the same, then you can do your correction at, from, from a preoperative planning standpoint. And, this, and the second ring is 65 millimeter distal. So remember, now it's interesting because it changed from the ankle to the subtalar joint magically. It's, um, but, from, uh, it's from previous workshop, I, I, so it was not correct. I'm aware. Um, but so measure, whatever your point is, measure from, we're gonna continue with the ankle for now, this is an old workshop, but um, measure from the ankle joint to the center of the ring and you know, just, Whatever that is, you know, mimic that in your frame. Okay, and then this is the, the other reference stuff. That I, everybody was seemed to be pretty comfortable, but just as a reminder, so we're going to use the proximal reference range. It, it's going to ask you is it proximal or different? Uh, how far proximal it is? The center of the ring is it uh, is it offset anterior or posterior? What the translation is? Um, and now when you do that, you can. In the hex portion, you can put the rings exactly where they are in the hex portion by dragging it up and down. So as you can see over here, that foot plate became 160. That's a 160 millimeter foot plate, 160 millimeter full ring. And this is the reference ring is 110 millimeters proximal. So as we showed you before, here is the ankle. It's 110 millimeters proximal. How do you measure it? Take a little ruler, and you can see how, how it is. Um, the second ring, uh, you basically also you want to write down here, it was put on perfectly, so there's no translation. It was 20 millimeters posterior, which we'll pull up in a second. So you can see how the center of the ring is 20 millimeters posterior over there. Once you're done, remember, save it, throw it out there. You'll get your mounting parameters, look to see if it looks similar. Now it may look a little bit off on these dowels. Don't get too hung up on that. You get your struts. Now once you did the hex ray, all the mounting parameter stuff got taken away for you. So when you're talking to the surgeon, he's gonna say to you like, why do I wanna go through all this? It's, uh, I'm so used to just taking measurements. I'm so used to eyeballing. My life has been so much easier. Now you're making my life difficult. And the answer is you're making their life much easier with this method. First of all, the surgeons that are eyeballing their um, hexapods are fooling themselves because they end up running more residuals and they're wasting more time on the back end by not spending the time on the front end. So there's no doubt about that if you're, if you're gonna eyeball it. Um, second of all, 
accurate measurements equal more accurate corrections, equal happier patients, equal less time for the surgeon having to talk to the patient. So that's the second thing. And as I mentioned before, the surgeon showing this to the patient gives the patient a much more deeper understanding as to what the surgeon's trying to accomplish with their deformity. And then the patient, when they're more educated as to what's going on, because they see these pictures and they see the correction, then they're more involved um, and they take better care of the post-operative period because they have a, a much, when you have a more deeper insight into something, you appreciate better. You know, somebody that collects baseball cards, they, you know, they like baseball a lot, but you know, show somebody that doesn't watch baseball or anything, they're not gonna appreciate the baseball card. So you, similarly, you know, you have to have the, 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 the patient involved, they can see this, they, they get it much better. Um, the surgeon will have more, a more accurate correction. Uh, it's, it's a little bit of a learning curve, but they're gonna get a much better result. And ultimately, it's gonna take them less time in the end once they quickly learn how to do this. So you have your, you can adjust your strut legs. So you, you know, like in the end, you know, you can, if you feel that you know you had a long strut that you don't want to, you want to make sure they're all like the same size or whatever, you can adjust that, save and update it, and then you get your views back over there. Go to the end of the correction. Um, before you build your frame, go to the report and make sure to check your strut changes. Look at the schedule. Okay, this we all know the uh, schedule on if you want a latency period. So for soft tissue correction, you can start the correction right away. Um, you don't have to wait even five days. Um, you want to do one a day, twice a day, do your calculation. Remember this drop down, you can calculate by angular max speed. That's why they picked that one because of the, um, because we're dealing with the appliance correction. But you can deal with, uh, you have a whole bunch of choices of how to calculate your rate of correction. You can do it by rotational max speed, you can do it by days of correction by millimeters per day. And then we get over here. One thing is that, I don't, I don't know if it comes up, no. If you click on one of these boxes, there's actually an arrow that you can just kind of click through and it'll actually show, it slowly show the Aquinas like kind of, kind of coming up. So if you have a quick internet connection, it'll actually you can just jump from picture to picture and the patient can see that as well. Um, so this part is pretty familiar with the program and the, uh, the um, schedule. So, you're gonna grab a 160 millimeter ring. Um, you can then do a double roll foot plate and a half ring. Build it all together. Attach your struts. Put the struts in the frame. And your final application should look something like this. If anybody needs help on this, we'll definitely uh, we'll be there for you on this portion. This is the uh, this is the easiest part of the portion. Is there so. A reason uh, here? Five eight string instead of a full ring. Well, that's for the uh, just have a second uh, a top portion. There is a little bit of visibility issue, especially if you put the distal block to distal, and you do the X-ray. Sometimes the posterior portion of the ring with the struts can overlap your ankle joint. If you want to monitor your destruction, it can make it a little bit easier. Not yeah, so if you have two rings that are kind of close together. So I, I come across this a lot in a miter frame, for example, in the foot. Those two bottom, those two bottom rings are very close all the time um, because you just deal with very sure. little real estate. So yeah, this bike, it, typically it's going to be for further away. It, it is for visualization, but okay. I mean, hopefully you, the surgeon builds it further away. Uh, for the lat, for the uh, training portion, I mean, you don't even really need this portion. But uh, there's a lot of pounds per pressure when you're doing these corrections. I, I had a patient that bent the wire. If you were here, remember earlier from, I think from yesterday, it showed that bent wire. So, I mean, it takes, uh, was it a few thousand pounds of pressure to bend the wire? And I've had patients, excuse me, bend the strut. And I've had patients bend the strut from the amount of force it takes to do a correction on this. Um, so, insert your needle face wire, attach your pins, keep everything aligned. Do not remove the deformity yet. So once you guys, once again in the beginning, you're gonna create your, the first thing you're gonna do everybody is create your deformity. So you gotta go and grab two wires and stick it up and, or you can stick it in sideways, just kind of get your deformity. That's the first thing you gotta do. The second thing, once you got your deformity, measure your deformity. Okay, so you're gonna measure your deformity, tibia, and remember it's not the planar aspect of the foot, but it's this little portion of the, of the foot, this bisecting the talus through the calcaneus, okay? Because that's what we want to straighten out. 
people, because everybody, when they do, when every, most foot and ankle surgeons, when they're doing a quinus exam, they're looking at the plantar aspect of their foot to the leg. But that's not, that's, that is correct, but that's not how you take the measurements. So and it becomes a little confusing for the first time users on the Aquinas correction. So get your alignment, get some opposing olive wires in the foot. Don't spend too much time on building these. You can just take in two half pins and just kind of hold the foot straight. You want to really spend more time on the actual hex portion. Apply your frame. You can do post-op mounting measurements. So if you want, once you get your frame built, you can go back, take another picture, and upload it as a post-op, okay? And you can rerun the same program, you know, just as a pure post-op correction. But remember, you're gonna measure, you're gonna measure, see once again, apex anterior. So this line to here, you got your apex anterior, um, you got your posterior placement of the, of the ring. You're gonna sit, it's gonna ask you the distance from the deformity so remember the surgeon, some of them may pick some tailor joints, some may pick ankle joints. It, it's, that's a difference of you know, about five to 10 millimeters, but every, you know, it, depending on the surgeon's preference. So you wanna go distance from the apex to the proximal ring. Once again, to upload the image. Okay, so you have to take a picture and upload the image. So it's gonna take a while to do all these things. But we'll, let's go through it step by step. If you have any questions, don't jump ahead so that we can just make sure you get each step properly. So now we're gonna do placement of the ring, okay? So we first have to calibrate before we place the ring, I apologize. Calibrate <coughs> first, that's the numero uno. It's not gonna let you go any further without calibrating. So there's various ways to calibrate. You can use that little 25 millimeter bowl again, or we, the known, we know the known is the ring thickness, so you can use that. You can drop a rancho cube, you, if you, if, or you can drop a, a cube that you know the known amount. The idea is to have the known amount of one item on the ring so that the computer can make the full calibration. So we know that this is six, well we know that the normal, the normal thickness of a ring is how many millimeters? Right, so in here it measures six, so it's gonna be if the known is 9.6 and the unknown is six, and then if the known is whatever this distance is gonna be, then we can know what the unknown, which is the reality of what this distance is. Okay, it's a really ninth grade math. Um, okay, so now we're gonna do our mounting parameters side by side. Remember, we have our proximal portion, distal portion, proximal distance, you can use the, this reference line so you know where you are. Use the line tool to draw this constant length in both planes because you have to make sure that you're in the same spot of both planes. So the point is, this point of the line we all know because we can just use the tip of the ankle. But how do we know this point of the line? And we have to make sure that this little blue dot is in the same spot as this little blue dot over there. And that's what I was saying to mark off your mark off on the tibia that you're using on for the um, uh, for the model. Uh, in real life, you're going to have to have some sort of marker there so you know you're in the same place. Okay, so there we know we're at the same level. Lock it down, move on. So it says osteotomy, but this, now you can make an osteotomy if you want. But. Okay, so your osteotomy level is gonna come out both at the same time. Make sure that you add in a little bit. Remember, end of correction parameters. So when you're dealing with a surgeon that's used to adding in the correction into the deformity, explain to them that this is how it looks now and this is how you want it to look. So the end of correction parameters is how you want it to look. So here's your distraction, and here's your correction of the Aquinas. Once again, really important to note, this is what we're correcting over there. Lock down on how much length you want, and move on. I'm gonna put your rings over. Once you have, so that's gonna ask you the next thing. They just say, you put down your 160 and open posteriorly 5 8 ring, 
your foot plate, and it's going to pop down on the screen. So you have to kind of maneuver it. Why? Because you, you measured before. Are you anterior or posteriorly tilted? You, you measured before your distance from the osteotomy to the ring. Um, so here, the, the, the computer can actually make sure that your distance is the same spot. So then you can double check, actually, against the um, model that you built. So here we see that's 24 posterior. It's a translate a little bit medially. How do I know? So in this particular case, so I would actually, if I were you, I would build it off a lot, meaning build build a more of a tilt into it, build it, translate it a little bit medial, so you can see that it shows up. You know, when you have such small amounts, you don't really see it a lot. Um, some, I mean, some, some people should build the plane perfectly, but for, for in case, for, to understand how it translates onto here, I would actually build that tilted, translated, I build it off so that I can see how it looks on the hex that it's coming off as well. Um, if the rings don't sync exactly, um, click sync off. Where is that again? Right there. Dr. Alice, do you want to explain a little bit more about the syncing issue? Yeah, this is, uh, again, in majority of cases, your projections are not perfect on x ray day either. Not exactly 90 degrees, right? Or it's not exactly perpendicular to the reference fragment on one of the X-rays. So for assumes you perpendicular to the reference fragment and you X-ray take a orthogonal to each other. So if by aligning ring on one of X-ray exactly as oblique, makes ring don't look exactly right on another X-ray, either tilt or not tilt at all, what you can do, you can actually on provide the ability to align ring and then unsync them. When you unsync, you can only change ring position. You cannot change the AP tilt when you reveal up. So you cannot change the UK. So what you do using opposite X-rays, make leading uh, ring look exactly as, as it looks. And then unsync ring and work. When you unsync rings, you can make two rings look exactly on each X-ray as it looks on ring drone ring exactly the next one. But you can end up with different measurements. The one measurement is different, the distance from a total inside the ring, then you need to decide which ring to use. Second rotation, then you need to decide which measurement to use. Again, when you have the question that mainly when moving the ring in one projection doesn't you know make it look the same. So if this is my fragment, I position ring like that. Mm -hmm. right? And I take X ray on AP like this. So obviously, in AP, my ring will look at straight line. But when I look on the rapid lateral, if I'll bring my ring from this position, on AP, it starts looking like that, even though you see it through the end. So this is the time when you may unlock them and work separately. And when you have the situation, just raise your hand and we can, we can work it out. And play with it in the system as well. So here you could, so now that that sink is off, you can kind of play with it a little bit differently. Once again, so what we're showing you here, just to review, to really understand, that there, you can use the hex in a pre-op planning or post-op. So you just have to know your surgeon, what they're doing. Are they doing pre-building or are they, are they, how they built it? Some of them will pre-build the frame. And so you have to know when to use which one. So this is, a, this is ones that, so, like a surgeon like myself, I like to I don't like to pre-build. I put it on, and then I'll take the measurements afterwards. So I would be using the second part of the uh, equation, this second part of the program. As you notice on the side there, it says pre or post. So they're just for the surgeon preference how they're putting these together. So once again, enter the size of your struts. This is now as opposed to the other one where it's going to tell you the struts. Here you're going to enter the size of the struts on how you put it on. Um, so that's. You, you're, you have to take those struts measurements in the operating room and then put it into the system, making sure you know the strut sizes and its lengths. Do the acute and gradual, confirm it. So you'll see uh, it'll give you a little bit of confirmation. One thing that some people ask, if you're using the hex, you can only deal with dowels. It doesn't, if you don't use the hex, then you can get the bone images. 
Um, so that so once you put on the hex, you're stuck with the dowels. But I think uh, the people that are using this already are the, the dowels are comfortable for them. And then, so you got your mounting parameters. You do your correction. Same thing as last time. You want a latency period. You want to turn it once a day, twice a day. Speed of correction. Strut changes in the formula. End of correction. If you look, oops, you if you look carefully, you can see your distraction over there. So let's go on now and remember. So get the deformity. Keep the deformity there. Don't take it out. And uh, use, uh, use a wire, two wires in order to hold that deformity. Measure the deformity. Okay. Then do your picture. Get your um, make your uh, what's it called? They have to do the image uh, portion where you're going to corroborate the images with the uh, uh, sizing, and then you'll do the uh, pre-op planning version versus the post-op planning version. Any questions?